we've got a number of people who want to ask you questions, uh, okay. but uh, we'd like to first offer you the opportunity to make some opening remarks and maybe just tell tell viewers why the Green Party deserves their vote. Well, I, I, I the argument that I'd make for why the Green Party uh, should should uh, earn the votes of people in British Columbia right now is that we've demonstrated in the last three and a half years what can happen when we aren't in an entrenched two-party system in the BC legislature. We've had uh, unprecedented levels of cooperation and collaboration, not just between us and the NDP, but across all three party lines. And I would make a really strong case that the legislation, the policies, the decisions that have come out of the legislature for the last three and a half years have been improved because of that collaboration. And that nobody, no one party um, had all of the say or all of the power. And that was a good thing because what we typically end up with after elections is about 40% of the electorate delivers to one party 100% of the power and for four years they can make any decision, pass any legislation they want, regardless of how you know the other party or the electorate feels about those decisions or what they think of them. A minority government, as we've seen in BC, has been uh, healthy for democracy, but it's been really good for the outcomes. Um, of course, we're not happy with all the outcomes that, that happened in the last three and a half years, um, but that's, that's the way democracy should work. No, no one party should have all of the say like that. So in a time like this, when what we need, you know, we're in this global pandemic, we're in, an, in a um, climate emergency, we have a, an ongoing opioid health emergency, we have a housing crisis. Uh, in a time like this, what we actually need more of is elected people to say, I'm here to listen to other perspectives let's put the best solutions we can on the table and let's make them happen as quickly as we possibly can because we have to be in service to the people of this province right now. So you have been critical of Mr. Horgan for tearing up CASA. And so if the Green Party has the balance of power after this election, can you see yourself signing another agreement to support the NDP? And if not, then what would happen? Yeah, I've been getting this question a lot, and I think one for one thing, I you know, the way that we we organized things in 2017, it's the first time in over 50 years that there was a minority government in BC. Um, there really wasn't a playbook. We decided to go with a confidence and supply agreement, which is one way that governments can be organized after an election. Of course, there's many many other ways that minority governments can be formed after an election. I'd look to regions like New Zealand, Scandinavia, and Northern Europe, where minority governments are are the the norm. They're the status quo, really, uh, and governments figure out how to organize themselves in order to, you know, best serve and and have the best governance possible. So uh, there's nothing. Of course, I'm disappointed with John Horgan for breaking our agreement for going against the Fixed Election Act. The, the reality is on the other side of this election, we're still in all of these emergencies. And the thing that we need to do is, is get back to work as quickly as we possibly can and in the most effective ways that we possibly can. And what I've seen is that we are most effective when we're working across party lines. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to say, you know, this is what I would do or this is what our caucus or our party will do. Um, but of course, we're going to work across party lines in the legislature, um, whether or not there's a minority government. Uh, I think, you know, it's it's a matter of a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of how we imagine politics and, and governance. And I think we need less politics and more governance on the other side of elections than we typically get. Okay, a question from Rob Shaw. Thank you. Hey, Sonia. Hi, Rob. Um, what would you say to voters out there who are looking at the polls right now and they see this possibility of an NDP majority or a super majority and they're interested in voting green, mm -hmm. but they're kind of worried about what a green vote does to, you know, that battle between the Liberals and the NDP. Given where we are and, and what mm -hmm. the numbers look like, what would you say to those kind of interested voters? 
I'd say that this is an election where it's really important if you're if you're inclined to vote green, then to vote green. What we've seen in the uh, ridings in 2017, where Andrew and Adam and I were elected, is that those green votes delivered to all of BC uh, a better form of governing in this province. Uh, and that's what's going to be really essential that it, 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 I, I hope we don't end up with a, you know, a majority on the other side of this. But if we do, uh, I think it will be very quickly apparent um, that we've lost something incredibly valuable in how our legislature works and that we will slide back into the kind of hyper partisanship. I mean, watching, <laughs> watching. <laughs> I was part of the CKNW uh, debate this morning, but there was a lot of time when I just sat watching and listening to Andrew and John kind of going back and forth the way that the legislature has worked for so long. Um, and, you know, the, what we've introduced into the legislature is an approach that says, you know, if we're unhappy with a policy or a direction, here's the solution that we think will work. Here's the evidence that backs up our solution. Uh, and here's how we think we can move this forward together um, in a majority. Uh, and we know how they, that works out in in uh, in governments here in BC and across Canada. The governing party adopts a kind of false, <laughs> false sense of like, well, look, you know, look what the 40 percent or the, you know, uh, even 50 percent of the voters delivered us this absolute power and we have every right to use it whatever way we want. That's that's not the way that we should be looking at things, but unfortunately, false majority governments operate as though they have the kind of right to not listen to other points of view for four years. And maybe you could uh, talk a bit more, you've mentioned it in the debates, but why John Horgan doesn't deserve a majority government in your point of view? <sighs> well, it's been interesting over the course of the campaign and in the debates, you know, the, the number of times that he's recognized the value of us working together and, and pointed to particular aspects like Clean BC um, as an example of, of that good working relationship. Uh, there's a lot more to point to. We have a salmon secretariat. Uh, we've made reforms to lobbying. Uh, we've banned big money. This is the first election that corporates and corporations and unions aren't able to write you know, six figure or even seven figure checks, uh, which is very good for democracy. Uh, the work we've done on land use decision making, professional reliance, environmental assessment, the innovation commissioner, uh, the emerging economy task force. There's a lot that the Greens brought to the table and that move forward uh, that that has benefited um, Horgan and his government and people applaud these outcomes. Um, and yet, here we were, we could have had another year and particularly in this pandemic to continue that work. And actually what I said to him when I met with him on the 17th was, you know, we could actually be bolder. You know, the, the, this is a time for real courage and, and real political boldness. Um, but it's clear that the calculation he made was he would rather have all the par power in the legislature. He'd rather not work. He'd rather not have the ideas that have been coming forward from us for, for over three years. And I I am, you know, of course, deeply disappointed. And I think voters should just ask that fundamental question. Do we want to give somebody who's motivated um, to call an unnecessary election out of a desire to have unlimited power in the legislature, should we give them that unlimited power? I don't think we should. Thank you. A, a question from managing editor Valerie Castleton. Yeah, hi, thanks for joining us, Sonia. Uh, I just wanna come back, I guess, to the confidence and supply agreement that Harold referenced. And uh, you, you, know, you make much of the fact that there should be more collaboration, collegiality, you know, cooperation, uh, get the politics out of politics. Um, but I guess my question is, where do you, what, what's a fundamental area in your estimation where you deviate from the NDP, where if if you were asked to work with them, what is a high priority for you, but just not shared by the NDP that is the source of perhaps, you know, where you want to direct your efforts, should you be in a similar position than before or two before? Yeah, thanks, Valerie. And, and, and it's a really good question. It's really important. And I think What's been what's become clear, and I think I've I've been communicating this a lot in this election, is that climate action actually has to be climate action, and you know, 
generation over generation or decade over decade, uh, governments and decision makers have chosen to talk about climate action and then literally do the opposite. And that's what we've had in the province here where, yes, Clean BC is a great example of climate action, an economic plan to move us towards a transition of our economy that actually uh, gives us a stimulated and healthier economy and more sustainable one on the other side. But the I've called it the the black hole in the middle of clean BC uh, was the decision to give these incredible tax breaks and subsidies to LNG Canada to prop up an industry that, you know, can't exist on its own, that needs government subsidies. And yet the costs of this industry in the long term are going to be far greater than anything that could come into it. So when we're looking at the economic impacts of, of climate change, the, the wildfire seasons of 2017, 2018, the flooding, the amount of mitigation that local governments are having to do and spend money on, the fact that, you know, Vancouver has to reckon with uh, sea level rise, um, as do all of the major coastal cities around the world. Uh, our water scarcity in some regions, the flooding in others, the, the, the folks in... Um, I always forget the name of the town in the Kootenays, that Grand Forks that have had to relocate, that can't stay in their homes because the flooding has become so significant. Uh, and so it, that is the fundamental um, point for me uh, that I can't reconcile uh, and would need to be addressed in some way going forward. Um, and, and we would have to find a way. I mean, that's, that's the reality. It's like you can't just keep throwing up your hands and saying, you know, I'm taking all my toys and leaving the sandbox, we have to find a way to, to make this work. Um, but continuing to subsidize fracking and the oil and gas industry in 2020, um, at the same time as we are literally choking on smoke from wildfires in the southern, in the Western US, is such a disconnect from reality. And both of the other parties just seem far too comfortable to be in that disconnected place. I'm not, I can't, I do not feel comfortable there. Thank you. Uh, a question from columnist Daphne Brahma. Daphne, Daphne are, you, are you on mute? Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't going to ask a question, but um, okay. it's curious okay. to me though, uh, when, when you talk about, um, about the environment being that bottom line for you, if you if you were to go into another agreement, when that when the supply agreement was made, um, the environment was not one of the primary issues. So I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering whether you whether you initially supported that agreement and whether whether you were somewhat offside with um, with the NDP and that it was really Andrew Weaver's deal that that fell apart and not a deal that you were in support of. No, I, I, I was I signed the confidence and supply agreement as did every member of both caucuses. Um, I think that uh, and, and this is another question for voters to be asking themselves right now, going into the 2017 election, and I had a woman approach me in Victoria about this the other day. She said, you know, I knocked on doors for the NDP. And when people asked me, you know, what about site C? As a door knocker for the NDP, she told people, if you elect the NDP, they will cancel Site C. That was the line that they ran on. Uh, they also indicated that they did not support the government, you know, the tax giveaway um, that Christy Clark's government had gone forward with for LNG. And so the, the challenge we had in 2017 was both that the voters believed them on their word, and so did we. To a large extent, we thought that if the evidence came forward, for example, from the BCUC as it did, that indicated that we did not have to go forward with Site C, that we could have generated the energy uh, with renewable projects uh, that would have been a more diversified uh, approach to the economy and also wouldn't have wiped out uh, both the treaty rights uh, up in the peace area, but also the agricultural land. Uh, you know, we thought that they would follow the evidence that that that. That's what they campaigned on. And so we we were um, perhaps at the time more naive about how they make decisions. I'm less naive now. Uh, I would say that 
you know, the the capacity to ignore evidence and to only hear the evidence that you want to hear uh, is problematic for the NDA. Uh, and and what informs their decision making uh, is is different from what informs our decision making. So. I would point also, though, to like the fact that we had professional reliance reform and environmental assessment reform had and and on professional reliance that had I not been there, that would not have happened. There was no interest from either of the other parties to see that that really problematic system that we have in BC, where industry hires its own professionals and government has no experts left to to really oversee land use and resource decisions that are deeply impacting communities. Um, that was something that was incredibly important to me. I'm glad I wasn't naive enough to think that it would just happen. I'm glad we got that into CASA. But uh, obviously, here we are three and a half years later, and everything that's happened informs decisions going forward. We are not the same, you know, we're not in the same position. Um, but it does come back to that trustworthiness. And, and the thing that the woman said to me, the door knocker, she said, well, the NDP made a liar out of me, and I'm angry about that because she promised people that they would cancel Site C. Thank you. Uh, question from Cassidy Olivier, the city editor. Cassidy, do you have a question? Um, sure, just in terms of the naiveness, I'm just, with all due respect, I'm just curious about that because it is one of the things that does come up a lot about this transition to a cleaner economy. How would that actually happen um, and what is really, you know, realistically that you guys could do? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question because, I mean, we, we could choose not to do it. We could say, oh, well, we'll just we'll let things unfold. And then we have things like a fire season in the Western United States where we have something that I, uh, I don't think any of you would have heard of growing up, like fire tornadoes. Um, fires that can't that cannot be managed, uh, or we could have the kind of uh, you know uh, impacts that we're seeing where temperatures are going above 50 degrees in parts of the world, uh, and and just say well it's it's going to be a little too hard to transform our economy so that we're stopping this kind of death spiral of our climate system, uh, and then on the other side we could say well if if we are serious about acting on climate change, about transforming our economies, and we identify where we want to go, then we start acting. We start putting the policies in place. We really do recognize that, um, you know, building a clean energy economy doesn't mean tying ourselves to the Western United States uh, kind of electricity grid, which means we could be getting our electricity from oil, gas, coal. Um, and instead, we we lean into with seriousness the fact that we have untapped reserves of geothermal in BC. We could be leaders on that. We could be world leaders on that. That we have a, a you know, we had a, a potentially thriving wind energy sector, which was largely wiped out when Site C was approved. We have the capacity to work with First Nations so that they can have energy resilience and economic independence uh, that isn't reliant on a boom and bust pipeline fueled uh, economy. Like I. It's a it's a kind of a, you know, I can imagine the future of us not doing this transition. It looks like a terrible future to me. It looks like, a, you know, we see the pattern, we see the trajectory, we listen to the evidence, we listen to the scientists. None of it is good news. We're losing our biodiversity, we're losing our habitat, we're losing our capacity even to handle the next pandemic because we need the biodiversity uh, for, for actually being healthy, for actually even having access to new medicines. So we could we could just say it's just too hard to do the transition and let that unfold, or we could say this is necessary. We're on this planet hurtling through space. Uh, this is all we've got, and and I think it's actually necessary that we try to do that transition and that we try to do it in a way that is more just and more equitable than the economy we have right now, which is frankly leaving way too many people behind. So uh, like I imagine a very different future that feels much more hopeful and much more resilient and where every community, and I, you know, I, I say these things, this isn't a message. This is actually what I truly believe, where every community could have what it needs to know, you know, we can weather the coming storms, literal and figurative, 
because we've built that social and physical resiliency in our communities. And then we we built upon that to social and physical resiliency in our regions in this province. And, and I, I can't understand the lack of urgency um, from other political parties and leaders on this because it, it's all I feel is urgency. I, I asked my 12 year old, my 14 year old, he was 12 and we were all, it was this funny conglomeration of ages in our house. He was 12, my eldest was 24, I was 48 and my husband was 60. And I was like, what, how often does that happen that everybody's a, you know, some sort of factor of 12? Uh, and I said, you know, it's your 12th birthday. How do you how do you feel about the future? And this is a happy go lucky, very cheerful kid. And he got really quiet. And I and I said, what's up? And he said, you know, I, I don't I feel bad about the future. And I said, well, what makes you what is it? And he said, well, pollution, climate change and Trump. And he said, I, you know, I, I look at the world and I, I'm not seeing a lot that's giving me hope right now. I want to I be a person that gives 12-year-olds hope. I, I don't think that we have any other duty in this role. So, yeah, I, I want to imagine a better future. I don't want to imagine what we do if we don't make the choice to transition our economy. That was a long answer. Sorry. No, very no thank you. Thank you. Um, it's very helpful. Uh, Rob, back to Rob Shaw, another question. Uh, Sonia, I was just wondering if you could reflect on um, proportional representation, which was a part of the CASA agreement. And I remember during the time, a lot of us were thinking, the NDP doesn't really want proportional representation because mm -hmm. they would like to get the Green Party in this exact position where, um, you know, it is fairly popular and you may end up with 16% of the popular vote, like in the last election, and still end up with fewer than three seats, uh, or maybe even no seats, and still a significant part of the popular vote. And I wonder if you could reflect back on that. Did you do you feel like the NDP were genuine in their desire to advance uh, proportional representation, or do you think now, looking at where the party is and where you are, that this is where they always wanted? Uh, to go, which is to try and seize ultimate majority power and uh, push you guys out. Yeah, I've I've reflected on it a lot, Rob, and I know I've always tried to, you know, find ways to see if I can make you less cynical about politics. I wish that you'd actually made me a bit more cynical back then about this particular issue, because I think I think that, uh, you know, when I when I look back on it, it does feel like it it wasn't it was it was set up to not succeed um it was too complicated uh it was too open to being able to be made into something that people could fear um and again uh here we are we would not i would make the case i you know i can't be proven right or wrong on this but i would make the argument that had we succeeded in getting proportional representation we wouldn't be in this election right now because this election is about one party wanting all of the power and with proportional representation you're basically agreeing um, that democracy is about sharing the responsibility of governing and that it's not about having absolute power and i i am disappointed that we're here. I think it it continues to highlight the fact that our system doesn't serve voters, it doesn't serve democracy very well, uh, and that it, it leads to these kinds of very political, very partisan lenses through which decisions are made, which is which are about power. And uh, I, I just, you know, again, I'm a historian. Uh, there's times when there's pivotal moments in history. I think we're in one right now. And the decisions made by people in 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 places of power who have uh, decision making powers really matter in times like this. And uh, it does it is a it's a dis disappointing place to be. And yeah, I think you're right. I think it wasn't set up to succeed. But given, you know, what you know now, if you could go back and do this again, do you think signing CASA was the right way to go? 
there were a lot of uh, a lot of moving parts, very fast moving parts in those first few weeks after the 2017 election. And the way that decisions were being made, I would not I would not do that again. Um, you know, there were times during press conferences that a BC Green position got put out uh, and it hadn't been discussed as a caucus or as a team. Um, and I think that we could have been far more strategic. We could have been far more thoughtful. There was there was uh, a lot of things that we could have done differently. Um, the leader at the time very much had uh, most of the say of what unfolded in those weeks. And uh, I would approach things very, very differently. I am a collaborative and inclusive leader. I um, do not think that I'm imbued with any kind of special powers because I'm the leader of a political party. I think it's a even more than any other role I've had in my life. It's a time when I have to listen to a lot of different perspectives, to seek out advice, and to be open to other opinions, and ideally as a team to be moving forward from a consensus place uh, and making our de decisions with a very clear sense of the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, not just in the short term, but in the long term. And so I think I would be a, a, a much more reflective and probably slower paced, uh, I would bring a slower paced approach to these kinds of discussions. Um, and, and one of the things I've thought about is, you know, there needs to be less of this, like you have one conversation with one side and you have one conversation with the other side. I think we need to start by having a, a general conversation. Uh, and we have to start by that, with that place of acknowledging uh, that all of us bear this very real and significant burden as elected people to move forward in the best way that we can, not for the parties that we represent, but for the people of the province. And just, I don't want to misconstrue what you said, but the way that decisions were being made, you would not do that again. And there was times when the then leader was making them on the fly. But for your perspective, if you had to go back and decide whether to show up in the ceremonial rotunda room and sign CASA, knowing what you know now and knowing the position the Greens are in now and knowing that you, this may be potentially, you, um, the end of the, that uh, cooperation, maybe even the party, depending on how it goes. Um, would you give yourself some advice on on what to do there, or or, <laughs> or or pause before you sign that agreement again? I know it's a bit hypothetical, but when you you're a historian and you're going to go look back on it, and you're you're okay. living that history. I, I feel like you're going to write a, a follow up, but it's going to be a sci fi novel, Ron. Right? You and Rich are going to get together and be like, Time traveling Sonia shows up. Oh, no, which one is the current Time Sonia? Which one? Is the... That's right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no way that, that any of us could have known, you know, I, I think I remember you, Rob, saying this isn't going to last more than six months. I think that the sort of general consensus at the time was this is basically an impossible situation. Parties can't work together. Well, we proved that part to be right. wrong. It showed that that's possible. And now the next, you know, for me, of course, I want to take in everything that I've learned in the last three and a half years and apply that to any decisions making going forward. I, I can't go back in time. I wish I could. It would be making, it'd be um, being a historian that could time travel. I mean, there are novels like that. They're pretty fun. Um, uh, but the, the work and the job is one, look where, look where you made mistakes, right? This is, as a teacher and a mom, this is a big part of how I, I look at learning is mistakes are, so essential. That's when we do our best learning, right? As long as we're not afraid. So as if we're in a place of fear, then we hide our mistakes or we don't want to acknowledge them or we pretend that they didn't happen or whatever that is. If, if you can say, yeah, these are mistakes. We made a mistake in how we arranged the, the proportional representation uh, effort. I really do think that. Um, the, the real important outcome of that is you do better next time. You learn from your mistakes. 
Uh, and so that, that's a twofold thing. You have to acknowledge that you're human and you make mistakes. I have no problem with that. But the other side is, is you know, how do you learn? How do you get better? We should all be striving to get better all the time. Daphne, you had another question. I did, and and you, it was sort of a nice segue. Thank you, Sonia, for that. Um, learning from mistakes. I'm wondering, uh, we are in the midst of two um, health crises. The one that gets quite often forgotten is, of course, the opioid crisis. Um, the the he seems to be moving, um, and certainly Dr. Henry, in some ways, is is also counseling um, towards a legalization or or certainly a much further decriminalization. There has been some pushback from addictions doctors, from um, registered nurses, from pharmacists, and so on, about um, this idea that we would that they would be prescribing drugs that are currently under um, under federal restrictions. And I'm wondering that where you would stand on this. Do you think that we have gone as far as we can down the harm, re harm reduction road and that we need to um, now be looking at uh, a more sophisticated approach to it that uh, obviously tries to keep people alive, uh, but also to do something more than just keep them alive. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the problems is when we talk about decriminalization, we talk about it as, as a sort of standalone kind of aspect, right? And it it can't be. It's not like we we move to decriminalization and then we rub our hands together and say, okay, we're done. Of course not. Like people need access to help and therapy and treatment programs and counseling. Uh, look at what Gabor Mate says about addiction, which is that it is rooted in trauma. And so, you know, I've I've spent a lot of time talking to people here in Cowichan about their experiences and 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 very quickly um, people that have come through addiction will go straight to that trauma piece and say this is this is where it started it started with this trauma in my childhood or um, you know when this thing happened or this confluence of events happened I, I found myself kind of spiraling down to this place that I never wanted to be or expected to be um, and so it's not that uh, you know, I think the the experts and the research and and the evidence shows us that treating a health issue, treating addiction as a criminal issue, isn't going to work. It's not going to solve this. So the decriminalization piece is one aspect. Of course, it has to be embedded in a in a whole person and whole community approach to how do we ensure that people have access to what they need to get well. It's a health crisis. It means people are unwell and we want them to get well. So if it's a, a broken bone, we don't say, you know, uh, here's a cast. Good luck to you. Right. There's there's rehabilitation. There's physiotherapy. There's all sorts of things that go along with getting your bone well. If it's cancer, you go through all manner of treatment and support. And you also get access to, you know, counseling and other support to recognizing that a health issue has profound impacts on our mental health and wellness. So if we treat addiction as a, as a health issue, then we focus on getting people well again. Would you include recovery and, and those sorts of therapies under the, under the medical services plan? Because currently most of that is not covered under medical services plan. And as a, in addition to that, if you could, how would you how would you describe how the NDP has treated this? Have they moved us all along the way? Um, but but mm. first, would you would you include it in MSP? And then how do you think we're doing so far? Well, I think I think we have to make access to treatment and and addiction recovery something that people can afford or have access to, whether they can afford it or not. I mean, we're talking about in many cases some of the most vulnerable populations we have in the province. And saying, well, until you can get your X thousands of dollars together to afford treatment, sorry, you're on your own. Like that doesn't make sense. And we also know that the cost of inaction, the cost of not providing uh, wellness and recovery and treatment it, it outweighs the cost of what it would be to ensure that people have access to this. Like this is a, a bad math to just let this problem continue to unfold. I would say in terms of the NDP, you know, I... I 
I commend them for recognizing the seriousness of it. Uh, I know that Judy Darcy um, worked very hard. I think that um, the actions did not fully match the urgency, uh, even as it was communicated by the NDP. So, you know, there's the words, yes, it's an urgent crisis, it's a health crisis, we have to do everything we can. Um, but what we saw in three and a half years was a pretty slow kind of uh, uptake and start off in getting actual services into communities. And I point to Cowichan as a really good example of we are, we are neither urban nor rural, but we definitely have an urban size uh, addiction and, and housing crisis here. Uh, and we worked very hard as a community to, to show, like to provide, here's the solutions, here's what will work in our community. And uh, it was very, very slow response. So I think that the urgency of action has to match the urgency of words. It's the same with climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, reporter Gordon Hoekstra, do you have a question? I do. Uh, thanks, Tony, for being here this afternoon. Um, some of these ideas that you're talking about that you've uh, laid out in your plan and your platform, some of them are costed, but many of them are not. I'm thinking about just things like the basic income, housing, equal pay legislation, transit, carbon neutrality. I'm just mentioning a few of them. Yeah. You know, maybe even removal of the oil and gas subsidies. Um, you know, when people are making decisions about whether to vote and you're you're making a serious pitch for their vote, how, how do they, I mean, if they don't know the costs of these significant policies, uh, you know, why, why, like, how do they, how do they vote for you? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. largely, you know, the other parties try and put some kind of cost around these things, mm -hmm. so have an idea about them. And I mean, obviously politics is about compromise. Sometimes you can't get everything that you want. Right. Um, anyways, I just wondering what, what, you know, what's your thought on that about, about not fully costing your plan or trying to cost as much of it that you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. I mean, we've done, we've we've put it out that it would be a ten billion dollar investment over the next three years to achieve the outcomes that we've identified. Um, and I I I would point to um, one thing I've been saying quite a bit in the last few days, which is everything that we've put in our platform really focuses on answering two urgent questions. One is how do we help people, small businesses? Uh, how do we help in this moment that we're in right now? because we're in this very uh, challenging, difficult moment. People are, are it, it, for a lot of people, this is the hardest year of their life. And we're looking at a winter that could be for a lot of businesses, tourism operators, uh, you know, devastating. This could be the end of their, their life's work um, and all of their investments. So we, we won, we need to recognize the urgency of, of where we are right now and have solutions that are available right now. So you know, focusing on helping small businesses pay their rents, 25% of their rents, ensuring that there's targeted grants for tourism operators that aren't so complicated that it, it immediately uh, removes eligibility for way too many of them, that kind of thing. But then all of the policies also point to, you know, does this lead us to a more sustainable future? Are we going to achieve better health and well-being? Is our economy going to be more resilient and is it going to more effectively serve uh, people in this province? And so, you know, we we have as much as we could in in the where are we at now? Four weeks of the uh, election campaign that we're in, uh, it put forward, you know, what we think are very evidence informed uh, and also very thoughtful uh, platform pieces that 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 address those two points of times right now, but also we have to think long term. Um, the other two parties, things like cutting the PST, uh, what is the cost of that in terms of revenue to the government? Well, we know it's between six and seven billion dollars. And the imagining, like taking that kind of revenue out of what is always going, already going to be a very strapped government revenue reality makes no sense. And so the cost of that kind of decision, the cost of uh, Horgan's proposal of, you know, the, the kind of Oprah Winfrey, a thousand dollars for everybody, as my 26 year old son pointed out today, while well, people have been getting served for the last several months, that that's, that's existed now. Um, but what we need to be doing, imagine where 1.3 billion could go, which is about the cost of that giveaway uh, towards uh, 
um, uh, you know, what we're talking about, removing the, the sense of scarcity from our public education system, addressing the inequality, addressing the entrenchment into poverty of so many people in this province because our, our income assistance programs don't actually lift people out of poverty. They trap them there. And what's the cost of having that? Like, you know, yes, it's important that we're fiscally responsible. I absolutely agree with that. Um, but what we don't measure are costs of decisions that are are actually harming our medium and long-term economy. And I'll come back to the, the decision to subsidize LNG Canada and, and subsidize the fracking uh, and to go keep moving forward with Site C, which like there's there's I don't think there's a uh, a mathematician or an economist in the world that can tell you that that this is a an economically uh, responsible uh, project anymore. We don't even have a price tag on it, right? We can't even the the engineers can't even tell us how this can possibly work. They don't have the solutions yet. It's like a contractor coming to you a quarter of the way into building a house and saying, well, we've got some real problems. I don't think I can make the foundation work, but can you just give me a blank check to keep working for as long as it takes? Uh, I'm not going to give you a budget. Uh, no, nobody would do that. You'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's that's a real problem financially. So yes, uh, we've done our best to, to cost these things. Yes, we're aspirational. Uh, but I think that what we need more than ever is a, a kind of politics and governance that says, we are going to identify the vision of the world that's possible, uh, and then we're going to start working towards that. If I, I could just maybe to follow up, this sort of touches on one of the things that Cassidy said. I mean, some of the things you're talking about in terms of, you know, changing uh, you know, our energy industry to something more renewable. Um, there are there are many people who are, you know, make their living and have jobs and that, and it, and it, it would involve some kind of transition. Yeah. Um, and that presumably would involve displacement of workers and you know and change in investment in in companies i mean two two questions have you have you done any kind of like analysis about what that implication might be and and if it does involve you know a particular displacement of workers you know how do you how do you assist those people but it's really interesting now because the oil and gas industry actually is built on displacing workers. So you have people from all over BC, they fly up to Fort St. John, or they fly out to where the, uh, you know, a pipeline's being built, they live in work camps, uh, and then they periodically come home. And we know that there are uh, social and physical and mental uh, health issues that come along with that kind of approach to, uh, to working, that you're not working in your community. Now, a, a, if we were focusing on building uh, a clean energy economy that included regional resilience when it comes to energy, you would actually live and work in the same community in the energy sector. So you look at projects like, again, Tumblr Ridge with the, the, the wind projects they have that have provided sustainable jobs uh, to the communities, including to the First Nations communities. You look at something like geothermal in the Northwest, if we were building that energy sector, you would be providing jobs to people that live in the Northwest right where they live. They'd also be creating the, the innovation and technology that could be moving us you know, forward in that way. If you look at things like um, Kimberly wanted to do a solar farm as part of municipal energy production, which like the Kootenays could then be helping them finance programs and services in their community based on their capacity to produce energy locally. Like, I, again, it, it's so interesting to me that we, we we think that the status quo is about as good as it gets. I, I think the status quo is nowhere near as good as it can get. And we know that the, these, the oil and gas industry has an unhealthy impact not only on our lands and our water and our air and our climate, but it's not a particularly healthy industry for the people who are working in it. So why don't we strive to have a, you know, a win-win where our energy sector is actually healthy, not only for the planet and the lands, but it's healthy for the people who are working in it. The, um, the green platform supports mobility pricing. Um, is that fair to those, particularly in the suburbs, who must commute to work because they can't afford to live near where they work, speaking of housing affordability, and have no option but to drive? Or in some cases, it's not a simple commute A to B, it involves, as you've, I'm sure you've heard from many people, uh, picking up children or taking them, and you've done it yourself, picking up children, taking them to this place or that place. Yeah. Um, 
it, it strikes some as a regressive tax on low and middle income people. Why mm -hmm. mobility pricing? But and just to be clear in our platform, we, we've said that we would look at something like we haven't said that this is exactly what we would bring in. However, the mayor's plan and Translink have identified that they need sustainable funding for transit. And when you're talking about low and middle income people, uh, those are the most significant users of transit uh, that we have in B.C. And the regressive impact of them having to cover through fares uh, increasing costs of sustaining public transit is also of a consideration that we have to take into place. The other thing I'll say is what we often do, we 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 separate like just as you've done. And I, I understand this and I get it. Like we 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 say, well, there's transportation in this bucket and we're just going to, you know, there it is. And then as you as you pointed out, like there's also the cost of living that people can't live in the same communities that they work. So we should actually be be kind of trying to solve these issues not just one at a time, like we're only going to focus on trying to solve this transit issue, but we're going to say, how do we have more livable communities? How do we have communities where people can actually live in the community where they work so that they're not spending one, two, sometimes three hours in their cars, which actually undermines their physical and mental health? Uh, you know, we know that the, the research says that spending that much time in a car in a commute every day is not healthy for you. It takes away time from your family. It takes away time from your capacity to be part of your community. It takes away time for you to be able to exercise and eat well, right? So what, again, let's if we if we start from this place of saying, how do we get to a place where communities actually have that that wholeness where you're not having to live, you know, an hour away or an hour and a half away in order to get to your job. Um, so much, look at all of you. I mean, I think you're all in your own houses right now, right? This is an example of a pretty rapid transformation of how we work has happened as a result of this global pandemic, but it couldn't happen uh, for some reason without the crisis that was upon us. Now, crises are a great moment to really make significant shifts. But we should be looking at the, the capacity for us to shift right now. People should not be spending an hour or two commuting anywhere. It's unhealthy for them. It's unhealthy for our society. And it's not to say, well, too bad, so sad. But we have to start looking at solutions that actually get us to a place where we want to be. This isn't an ideal situation for anybody uh, that they want to be living in. Now, I think about here, I have no choice if I want to go to Victoria uh, we've got a couple of commuter buses that go very early in the morning and a couple that come back in the afternoon. It really isn't an option. Uh, if we had reliable, very accessible uh, transit, I would be quite happy to get on there and be able to, you know, read a book or do my emails or whatever it is, rather than sitting in my own car the whole time. But in order to achieve that, we need that reliability and that accessibility in transit. We need to make it pleasant. I, I you know, I'm attended a talk on sustainability when I was first elected as an area director. And, and you know, the point that the, the guy made was if if the decision makers actually use transit, transit would be a very luxurious thing indeed, you know. Uh, and so how do we, it, yes, I can understand that people would be anxious about an additional cost on top of having to commute. But the, the real question we should be asking is how do we organize our communities and our cities and our regions so people are not spending uh, all their time commuting in their vehicles. Thank you. Castille Olivier? Uh, yeah, this is a bit, uh, uh, you've spoken about this. I'm looking for an updated comment on a, a new story that's just happening right now for one of our other reporters. But Laurie Thronis was dropped as a candidate um, from the Liberal Party. Just curious, how, how would you have handled a, a similar situation or a, sim a similar situation have come up with one of your own candidates? And how, what does Mr. Wilkinson's handling of it say about his leadership? Yeah, I, I've only got a few details on this. I've been literally doing this all day long. So um, I am aware that uh, Lori made some pretty, uh, pretty distressing comments about contraception. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I'm going to step back. I'm going to look at it in a bigger context and then I'll come back to your to your question, because um, political leadership should be about 
what are we aspiring to become? Where do we want to get to? What does the world that we want to try to build together look like? All of those kinds of things. Um, what happens is political parties will identify um, particular segments of the population that they could count as their base, and then they they do things to kind of appeal to a base, perhaps, right? When you ask the question, what would I do as leader of the Greens? Well, one of the things about the Greens is we have we, we operate not from a kind of a um, ideological way. I mean, of course, every there's there's ways of understanding things, but we have our core principles, right? So social justice and sustainability, nonviolence, uh, equality, um, and and ideally, uh, what you want in a candidate is someone who ascribes to the same set of core values, and that you can sort of see you're working towards a, a shared vision for the future. Um, in this case, where a candidate has spoken in this way, I think it is important for a leader to identify that there are some lines that that really should not be crossed and, and that um, leadership involves recognizing that uh, if this person represents your party and, and what this person is saying is really um, anathema to your party's values and positions, then that person should probably not be representing your party. Um, but uh, it's uh, it's it's a you know almost every election there's a situation like this where a candidate says or does something or something they said in the past comes up and it, it becomes a real flashpoint. Um, but I, I think that it in you know in this case it I really was quite shocked by the things that Laurie said about contraception and at the same time I do want us to remain focused on what we're trying to achieve here uh, collectively in an election is to uh, ideally put forward a vision for the future that's what elections should be about is what is the future that we should be trying to build together Okay, well, time, if you do have time for one more question from Valerie Castleton. Yeah, well, well if this is the last question, I'll have to change my last question. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, well, okay, I, I'll ask about, uh, about reconciliation and, and ask you if, to your mind, the other two parties are really truly committed to uh, reconciliation. Uh, and then also, more particularly, I would ask you whether you think the NDP has done enough to reach out to First Nations and consider their positions, particularly perhaps on energy and resource issues, because I assume you would do something different, would you? I certainly would aspire to, and I think my experience here in Cowich, and I'll just start there and then I'll get to your question, which is, you know, we realized and recognized very quickly after opening our constituency office that we had a uh, a very serious issue. We have twice the provincial average rate of apprehension of Indigenous children in Cowichan. So uh, a lot of Indigenous children are being removed by Ministry of Children and Families, which to me is a, a, a reconciliation issue. This is a colonial practice. Uh, it's been underway We've seen the results of it generation over generation. We know the impacts, the trauma it has, and yet we continue to replicate the same practices, expecting different results. So in my work, um, that meant uh, we hired an indigenous woman in our office uh, to be meeting with families who were coming in seeking support on these files. She had a lot of background. She was working, she used to work with the um, delegated Aboriginal agency here in Cowichan, and so she had expertise, um, but also relationships and connections with uh, the local First Nations community. Um, but also we started working as a community, creating uh, kind of collective space for conversations about, again, where do we want to be in Cowichan uh, in the future when it comes to child Indigenous children in our community? What is the responsibility that all of us have but um, to ensure children are thriving in our community? But how do we move away from this position that we're in where we are deeply overrepresented in the number of Indigenous children being uh, removed from their families and their community here? Uh, and we, were, we did that work with people from Cowichan tribes, with their leadership, but also with people from the communities. Um, and ultimately, that resulted in 
um, funding coming forward for two women to to write a report called Kashintal, um, Walking Together, which was to identify what are the conditions underway in, like in Cowichan that are contributing to these outcomes, and what are the solutions from the point of view of Cowichan people uh, that need to be implemented to ensure that we can uh, move away from the the reality that we're in right now. Um, I did get the the one of the the women that worked on that report in front of Minister Conroy, but there was very little interest or uptake from the ministry uh, on that work that we had done in our community. But to me, that is you know that is the kind of it's not for me to say I know this. Um, it is to find ways that the solutions are coming from Indigenous people and from the communities. Um, in terms of the NDP, well, Bill 17 and, tw and 22, the two bills that John Horgan likes to kind of trot out as, as the bickering and disagreement in the legislature, both of these bills had profound impacts on Indigenous people and communities. 17 was an energy bill um, that many First Nations communities were considering as, a, as potentially very devastating to investments that they've made in clean energy projects around the province. Um, because it removes the self-sustainability clause, uh, and and that could have deeply undermined and or really brought to an end the renewable energy kind of sector in BC, much of which has been led by First Nations communities. At the urging of previous governments, um, you know, as economic development, and and this is as a, a, a story that's been told way too many times in BC and in Canada, which is you know, the provincial or federal government going to First Nations and saying, here's your economic development, we'll give you money to, to get into this. And then 10 years later, it's like, oh, well, that's not that's not it anymore. We're taking the rug out from under your feet. Um, and you'll just have to wait for the next big, great plan we come up with. And so it, for us, for Adam and me in particular on Bill, on Bill 17, uh, we really from many, many, many First Nations, from UBCIC, from FNLC, about very serious concerns about the impacts that that bill could be having on First Nations and communities. And what we also heard was there really was not any uh, conversations, much less consultation, uh, in bringing that bill forward. And this was the first session that we'd had after passing UNDRIP. And, you know, UNDRIP is meant to be this, this fundamental shift in, in how we do legislation in British Columbia, in the relationship between governments. Um, and, and I, I remember very clearly, um, you know, my my own sense of like, if we let this go, if this is if this is how the first session after UNDRIP goes, and it it brought no shift at all into how this kind of legislation comes forward that impacts First Nations, then it's kind of like the, you know, it it sets the tone, it sets the stage. This was just for show. It doesn't mean anything. And I think it really has to mean something. And that's why, you know, from, from Adam's point of view and my point of view, the there was still work to be done. Go do the work. Do the work that you committed to when you passed UNDRIP. Make it mean something. And it was so shocking to us that it it just didn't seem to mean anything. And for us, as it was part of the confidence and supply agreement, it really did mean something. It it it, it was supposed to be a, a really transformative shift in in this province and a long overdue one. And so, um, it, again, it's a words, not actions. Like it, saying the words isn't enough. There has to be action that backs up those words. Well, it, just one sorry follow up to that yeah. and it, it, with regards to under would the same then not apply to those First Nations? who see LNG as a important part of their own economic development, how can that you then turn around and say, turn around and, and say no, say no to them on that? Yeah, it, and it's it's a really important question. And, and, and I think this is where the intersection comes across different you know, responsibilities that we have. And when we understand the impacts of uh, you know, something like the largest point source emission project in Canada, uh, being subsidized at this point when we are in a climate emergency, uh, you know, that's a that's a a really difficult and challenging place. But I would argue that if the economic opportunity was there in the Northwest to be developing a geothermal uh, energy sector, 
on top of it, we could have the Northwest Institute for Renewable Energy, which would be developing an innovation and education sector in that region. Uh, and then on top of that, we could be looking at what kind of manufacturing could we be doing there, because it's it's a it's an, a port a port and uh, not only to the ocean but a, a, a rail port to all of North America. Like, why are we not seizing on other potential opportunities? And it's that dearth of imagination, that lack of imagination, that the only path forward is a path that is a you know either destructive in terms of climate and environment with oil and gas, or destructive in terms of you know, taking down the last of our old growth forests at a time when, uh, you know, I think we have a global responsibility to be uh, making decisions that don't further imperil our climate and our environment, but also recognizing that these are short term economic decisions uh, that have a, a final expiry point. We should be doing economic development that doesn't have uh, these kind of finite points. It, the world yeah, is and I understand that's your yeah. uh, that is your that is your position and and I, I yeah. respect it but you you must concede then that you are you are cherishing aspirations of one group of first nations over the other but but if the only option being put you're, in front of first nations is lng and we know that under the clark liberals that this was like the only option. I mean, they could come forward with other plans but they're they're choosing to support that option and and you're but, not but, but what are the other options that like I'm, what I'm arguing is if we're gonna if we're gonna work in collaboration and cooperation, it can't just be this is the only option there is, and that that is literally what's happened is this is the only game in town, and I would say that you know it's also the responsibility of of the provincial government to have that that recognition that yes we need economic development and and we need to have those options for First Nations around the whole province. But it can, the, if the only option that's put on the table is LNG, uh, that's not really an option. That, that's, that's, that's all you got. That's all you, the only choice you get. Uh, economic development also has to go hand in hand with a, with a vision for a, a transformation of our economy. I, 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 you know, I, I understand that there, you can see that there's a contradiction here, but ultimately uh, the provincial government chose to subsidize that industry with billions of dollars in tax cuts and deferrals and all kinds of things. Uh, if they had done the same with geothermal or clean energy, then the option would be there for economic development in those regions for First Nations that doesn't involve uh, putting our climate in further peril.